Good morning, Northland Church. We're so grateful that you're here. Thank you for uh, bringing the church into these rooms in which we've gathered and as we gather here. Let me remind you that it's for a purpose. That purpose is to worship God for who he is and what he's done. Today we worship God who is the one who came as love itself and that's a reason for us to gather together and celebrate and we're so grateful that you're here. If you're here for the first time or new to Northland, we'd love a chance to connect with you before you go. There's a tear off card in the worship guide you were handed. You can fill that out, hand it to an usher as you leave. Uh, but if you've got a few minutes, we'd love to meet you back in the hub. It's a room that's back there off the foyer. You'll find some friendly people there who would love to connect with you and hear a little bit of your story. And, uh, and we'd love for you to be back. Uh, we're here every Sunday morning, but we'd love for you to come back. Thank you for coming today. We also want you to know that Northland has gathered in a number of locations uh, around the community, around the world, including uh, part of Northland's in Oviedo, part of Northland's in Mount Dora. There's home churches in Ponce Inlet, Florida, and Austin, Texas with us right now uh, online. We welcome you folks. And then several different correctional facilities, including uh, the Seminole County Correctional Facility in Sanford, Florida. Go ahead, yeah, that's good. That's for you guys. Uh, the Tomoka Correctional Institution in Daytona Beach, Florida. That's for you guys. And the Polk Correctional uh, Institution in Polk City, Florida. That's for you guys. We're so grateful you're with us. You're a part of our family and we're so glad you're here. Along with these groups, there's so many individuals online. Uh, your web ministers this morning uh, are Mike Walker and Bill Geary, and they would love to connect with you. And I was just looking down through the names back, backstage there, and, and folks gathered from all corners of the world and all over uh, the country. And we're so grateful that you would uh, come and, and join us in worship today. Hope you'll connect with uh, one of the online ministers while you're there with us today. Day. I want you to know a couple of things uh, for you folks locally here and the folks online. Uh, there are Christmas parties going on throughout this uh, season of Advent. Uh, you can learn more about that by stopping in the hub this morning, or you can also find out online, not just in Orlando, but in various cities around the country, including the Lasers who are online right now, reminding me there's one in Chicago. Uh, you can contact them through the web minister there, but uh, other places that are having Northland Christmas parties around the world. Uh, the other thing to tell you about the hub is there are folks back there that would love to talk to you about Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, as you know, we have thousands and thousands of people that join us, and we are thrilled that they come on Christmas Eve. People that are never here, yeah, we are thrilled that they're here on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Some of you are like, I, I might be, I might be happy. But um, many of you are genuinely happy, and, and we're glad about that. But here's the deal, we need many, many volunteers, more than normal on Christmas Eve. Uh, you don't have to be more than normal, you just have to be normal. And, but we need your help on Christmas Eve. And if you stop in the hub, the folks there can tell you uh, the various opportunities that would be available to you to come and serve this wonderful congregation on Christmas Eve. We hope you'll do that. Also remind you, the Bloodmobile is here today. It's a great way to serve the community. Hope you'll stop and do that. Right now, would you take a moment and just stand up and meet and greet and welcome one another. Great job. You can be seated once you've uh, sufficiently welcomed one another. We appreciate you doing that. And so here in this uh, second week of Advent, I love the way Pastor Joel has laid out the teaching series, and we're following him in that. 
in everything else in the context all around the, the preached word of God, what we sing and pray and think about even in between songs is all goes to the same direction each week. And during this uh, season of Advent, as you may know, these four weeks that lead up to Christmas Eve, there's a liturgy in the church that's been present for hundreds of years that tells us the story and takes us in a direction. The first two weeks of Advent are really focused on the prophecy regarding the coming of Christ, both the coming of Christ as a baby in a manger where the church was born, but also the coming of Christ ultimately as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, which he already is, but he will come back and establish that kingdom. And the first two weeks of Advent are focused more on that future part of Advent. The second two weeks are focused more on the past part of Advent. You'll see that as you hear the Advent readings today and the lighting of the Advent candle. Last week, Pastor Joel taught us about the fact that Jesus came, the great I Am, came as the peace of the world, the shalom, the wholeness, to bring us back to himself. Today, the second candle of Advent is the love of Christ, because it is the love of Christ that not only gives us relationship with him, which he initiates, but also includes us with one another. It turns out that we can't say that we love God and hate one another and tell the truth at the same time. Because if we love God, then we must love one another as well. Because the very nature of God is love. And so the, the formula that Pastor Joel's been teaching us, I am equals us for them there. Today is the us part. And the us, those of us in these various rooms, we represent the love that God intends to distribute throughout this world and hopefully in the room in the place where you're in today. It's an incredible thought that the God of the universe would be Emmanuel, that the word would become flesh, dwell among us. That is the best news. In fact, John Wesley, one of the great fathers of the church that founded the movement of Methodism, his last words, his dying words, were these words. The best of all, the best of all is, God is with us.
You may be seated. Hello, my name is Amanda. Hello, my name is Carolina. Hi, I'm Stacy. We worship with you each week from the Johnny Polk Correctional Facility in Seminole County, Florida, and we bring Christmas greetings to all our Northland family. Please join us in reading today's liturgy. Advent is the season when we gather to celebrate the birth of our Savior. It is a season of preparation and expectation of mystery and truth. As we wait to see God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, we put ourselves in the place of God's people who anticipated his coming thousands of years ago. We will read together the story of his incarnation. It is the story around which the church is formed. Together, let's read the words of Isaiah as he foretold the coming of our loving Savior in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 through 3, and the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. We celebrate this season as the church has over the centuries with the lighting of the Advent wreath. The candles represent the light of Christ. The candle symbolizes his love, the love that redeems the world, that love that unifies his church. Please pray with me. Lord, surely our eyes have seen your salvation, whom you have prepared for all the world a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let me invite the communion stewards to move to the locations from where they will serve you. Amanda and Carolina and Stacy have prepared us well for what this table means. Because just as surely as Advent both is a looking forward and a looking back, so is this table. This sacrament is something we do that anticipates the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in fact, as Paul taught us, every time we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until he comes in all his glory. But it also points us back to the fact that for that to happen, it must have happened that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And from that manger, not only was the church born, but the church was given redemption through the life of Christ himself. 
And so we proclaim both as we gather around this meal. You would expect if someone invites you to a meal that they would have made every provision for that meal and they would be prepared to pay for that meal. Otherwise, it's not an invitation. Well, that's exactly what Jesus has done. He has provided for us in this. He has paid the price for us to partake. And this is a mystery and it's good that it's a mystery for us, but it should not be confusing for you. And so if you're confused about whether you belong to Christ or whether you should partake of this, of this holy meal, we would love to help you with that, love to pray with you and explain to you this. And so right now at the back of each of these rooms, here in this room, as well as in the correctional facility, in those house churches, there are folks there that can help you understand what we're about to partake of in this sacrament. And we encourage you during this time to even get up and go and, and ask those questions and, and pray those prayers with the folks that are back there to serve you. Here are the practical ways that we'll partake of this today. There will be an usher who will invite you to move forward to where the stewards are. There you'll take a piece of bread, dip it into the cup of your choice. The lighter liquid is juice, the darker is wine. You can partake immediately or you can take it with you back to your seat if you'd like to continue to ponder or give thanks for what God has done for you. If for any reason you can't move to where the stewards are, there will be folks with trays and they will be looking for you. If you get their attention, they'll serve you right where you are. And parents, we would ask you to give your children direction on how they should partake of this. But for all of us, we know from God's word how this provision came about for us. For the scriptures tell us that it was on the night that he was betrayed that Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body. It's given for you. Take and eat this. And each time you do, remember me. And in the same manner after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he said, this is the new covenant that I make with you. Take and drink this, and each time you do, remember me. It is the body of Christ. It is the new covenant of Christ that forms us, forms us as the people of God, forms us as the church of God. And so would you come and have communion with him and with one another? as the usher invites you to do so.
Would you stand and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for those words we just saw from 2 Corinthians that remind us that you, the one who was rich beyond all splendor, for love's sake, became poor so that we, through your poverty, might become rich. And we are rich today in the mercy and grace of you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We are rich today in the assurance of your presence with us, among us, in each of these rooms in various locations across the world. We're rich today in knowing that you will come and put an end to envy and strife in this world. But we pray for that to take place, that the peace that we learned about last weekend, the shalom, the wholeness, would come to this troubled world where there is division and where there is racism and where there is all manner of of things that go on around the world from here to Syria to Yemen to those various places, we pray that the Spirit of Christ would be present in us and that we would be, the church would be present in those locations. And so, Lord Jesus, come and remind us of the way you would have us then employ the love you have shown and put into us. Come and give us that through the teaching that your servant, Pastor Joel, will bring us from your word. Come and give us that by your Holy Spirit as you illuminate that word. And come and give us that as we give back to you what is yours in the first place, our lives, our resources, and the mission that is your church to make us reflect the great I am, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, here comes Christmas. Here comes Jesus. Jesus is coming into the world again, this time through you. And I wanna tell you about that in just a minute before I get to the the, um, sermon text, let me, let me, talk about a couple of things. First of all, we're not going to have, uh, because of the arrangement of this particular service, announcements at the end of the service. It ends kind of tenderly. And, um, and so let me just um, say to those of you in this room, those of you online, there are people available for prayer, uh, and they would love to have it with you after the service if you'd like. Uh, also, those of you at the Longwood site, um, give some blood if you can. Um, Uh, I can never get over the powerful symbolism of our new life through the shedding of Jesus' blood and how we can give others new life with a donation of ours. Um, It just makes a lot of sense. It's a Jesus thing to do. Um, And then um, we won't have questions and answers. Um, That's kind of suspended for the time being just because of the arrangement of the services. But if you have questions about about the faith, about the Bible, about Northland, about anything, send them in um, to askapastor at northernchurch.net and we will answer them. Somebody will answer them. And we love to do this, uh, by the way. And so we want to uh, keep in close touch with what you're thinking. All right, one more thing. Uh, I'm I'm continuing my obedience and repentance right in front of you. Uh, I I said for 40 some years, I really didn't talk about money and I was kind of proud of it, you know, (laughs) until the Lord came to me, he does this, you know, you know how he does this. He's, had, he's done it to you. And I said, what are you doing? You know, money's one of the, way, the main ways I want to bless my people, come, to, come into their lives, use them for the blessing of the world, and you're not teaching on it for crying out loud. What do you, you know, so I said, okay, all right. So, so a few, uh, well, it's been about two months ago now, uh, I, started, I started just giving a little segment and I want to give another one today. Let me tell you where we've been. Uh, the first segment I, I gave was about um, intimacy doesn't happen without investment. This is true for every relationship, including our relationship with God. 
And, 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 and if you withhold any part of your life from that relationship, then you won't build that closeness in that aspect of your life. And so that's why Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He wanted, he knows our treasure, uh, it's, it's not our treasure, he wants, it's, it's a closeness to us. The closeness that will only come through our giving of our money. Um, and so God wants that for us. Um, the second week I talked about um, um, fruit, fruitfulness. All of us want to know that our lives have made a difference in this world. We want to know we've, we've had an impact in this world. And the Bible teaches that you can't have much of an impact just by what you do alone. You've got to let go. And Jesus talked about the sowing the seed. You know, if, to, if, you want, if you want to multiply 30, 60, 100 fold, you've got to let go of the seed. And you've got to find good soil. So if you, if you give your money to a Bible-believing church that makes a difference, your impact will be multiplied 100 times beyond what you could use that particular money for. Out of God's guidance, you'll see this when you get to heaven. Um, sometimes it's hard to see in this earth, but, but this was a teaching of God because he wants you to be the most productive. That's why you're still here, to be fruitful. And then I talked about the tithe, and I'll come back to this, uh, but, but just in the basics. There are blessings that come through the tithe that you can't get any other way. And God wants you to have those blessings. Um, and, 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 and it says in Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe, tithe is a tenth in my storehouse, test me. I, this is the only type, place in the Bible where it says this, test me and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and, and give you more blessings than you can possibly hold on your own. Now this takes faith, doesn't it? Because again, it's not about the money with God. It's about what he wants to build in our life. And what's he, what he wants to build in our life is faith and trust. And the only way he can build that is to, for us to actually have faith and trust. So, um, um, and then, and then um, a few weeks ago, I talked about God's provision. You know, everybody worries about, are they going to have enough? And, and, and Jesus, is, you know, in the sixth chapter of Matthew, he, goes, he, he just basically said, what? Why, why would you do that? That won't do anything to increase your life or, or prolong your life. He says, God knows you need all of these things. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. In other words, I'll take care of you. I don't want you to worry about basic provision. I got gotcha. you. But I want you to focus on God and, 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 and not focus on what you have or don't have. And then, and then, um, uh, last week, I think it was, I talked about this great prayer in First Chronicles 29 of, of, of David. And he was just so, he saw this great offering and he just was overwhelmed with God's personal blessing. And he said, who am I and who are these people that we could offer this much, that we could offer like this? One of the main problems in all of our lives is we so easily get a poverty mentality. Poverty isn't about how much money you have or don't have. Poverty is about how poor you think you are. It, it's, it's about how all of us don't feel like we measure up or don't have enough or whatever. That's, that's simply a mentality. The Bible says repeatedly, be, be content with what you got. Watch what I do with it. And so, and so God wants for us to understand that um, he doesn't want to just um, free us from our want. He, he wants to free us from our wanting because a poverty mentality is I always want more. I always want more. And it's called, in the Bible, it's called covetousness. And the main antidote to covetousness is giving. Uh, it's, 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 it's saying, I'm not poor. I, I'm a giver. And, and, and this is what it says in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In other words, he's saying, this, this too isn't a money. It's just, it's, don't think that by getting more money, you're gonna have what you want. There, there was a book that was written in the 70s and it was entitled, How to Get By on $100,000 a Year. This is in the 70s, how to get by on $100,000 a year. Now, some of you would like that challenge, wouldn't you? 
But what he was saying was, it, no matter how much you have, if you want more, what you have will never be enough. So he wants, us to, he wants to free us, not just from our want, but from our wanting. And, 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 and so therefore, make giving a part of your worship, not just on, when you come to worship, but, but all the time. And I'll talk to you more about that later on. Okay, now let me get to the text. You know, we're going through this Christmas season following the nature of God. Last week we talked about God as the great I am. And how God is the beginning of everything and the end of everything. And he put in us this guidance system so that he can guide us back to himself. But in all of us, he put this great gift and made all of us a great gift to the world. But here is the other news. That great gift cannot possibly be developed fully by yourself. He made you to need other people in order to deliver that great gift into the world. Why? Because God in his essence is a relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he made us in his image, he made us for relationships. And so therefore, we will never be fully developed until we actually love. <laughs> you know, we all say, oh, God is love, love is good, I love love. But love is difficult. I mean, real love, it's really difficult. And not many of us do it very well. And so therefore, we need to kind of pay attention. Okay, how is God actually going to get born into this world? When we actually have relationships that not only do we love, but relationships that help us love better. And that is tough, especially in this kind of culture. You know, I was reading in a clergy journal how few people have someone they could call a confidant or their best friend or their, or their close friend. 60% of men over the age of 30 could not name one person who they would name as their close friend and confidant. 60% of men now. Women had five or six. But it turns out that they were functionally based. Not based just on we are in this together and we, we, we're, we're very close, but it was all about function, you know? Men were just a little bit more independent operators. And, and, and this is for a very good reason because love is very complicated. Because people don't come ready to love or to be loved. Have you noticed that? I mean, they need it. All of us need it. But we, we don't come equipped for it. We don't come prepared for it. I, we were doing some Christmas shopping with our grandkids um, this week. And, and we, we, we do the bargain things, you know, because there's limited budget and, <laughs> for both of us. And, uh, and, but we take them into dollar stores and all that kind of stuff. You can get some pretty cool stuff at dollar stores. But it got me to thinking in these big, big budget stores how they have bins of stuff. And, and the bins, it's radical sales, you know, but they have little disclaimer signs that give you, you know, <clears throat> they have signs that say, as is. Now, when you, when you are buying something from an as is bin, you kind of know there's something wrong with here. There's, this, there's, there's something wrong with this, you know. Uh, this seems easy, but it's not going to be all that easy. It seems fully satisfied, but it's probably not what I picture in my head. I, I picture people like that. People come as is. You know, it seems like you're getting more than you are. And there's, it's probably not going to be as perfect as you think. There's other bins that say, slight irregularity. <laughs> I'm not sure what, the, what that is, but there is one. And practically everybody you run into has a slight irregularity. <laughs> not always apparent, you know. You know, and, and many items say some assembly required. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is with relationships. You're not going to have the relationships you want until there's some assembly there. It's difficult to really love, but it's imperative because what God has given us to give to the world, 
will not come until we are loved and until we love well. And it's contrary to many of, the, many of our natures. I, uh, I'm going to get to scripture in just a second, but I, but I want to set this up well. Um, John Ortberg um, wrote a book. I love this title of this book. Listen to this. Everybody seems normal till you get to know them. That's the title of the book. Everybody seems normal till you get to know or No, everyone is normal till you get to know them. That's the title of the book. And in that book, he has this illustration. He says it's about porcupines. You know, porcupines are pretty antisocial. You will never see a herd of porcupines. This doesn't happen. They're, they're, porcupines have this nature where they either withdraw or attack. They either withdraw or attack. I've noticed that about some people. By the way, that is one of Satan's main strategy to get you to either withdraw or attack. That's his main strategy for us. That's his main influence on us. If he can get you to withdraw or, or, or self-isolate, that's his favorite thing. If he can get you to attack, that's his next favorite thing. But porcupines, back to, back to John's illustration. Have you ever noticed there's not a, nobody ever like features a porcupine as a friendly, you know, we've got all these friendly critters, you know, there was Lassie. Oh my goodness, everybody loved Lassie. Lassie the dog. Some of you are old enough to remember Mr. Ed the horse, the talking horse. Remember that? Uh, um, 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 Arnold the pig. Remember Green Acres and Arnold the pig? Of, of, you know, more recently there's, a, there's a Flipper the dolphin and, and Willie the killer whale and, and uh, um, um, even skunks have Pepe Le Pew, you know? <laughs> But not so with porcupines, because their nature is either to withdraw or attack. Now, here's the problem, and this is why I even tell you this at all. If at some point porcupines don't at least leave themselves open for a little love, they become extinct really quickly. So somewhere they've got to go against their nature. And they've got to say, okay, I'll, uh, I'm going to allow somebody in here. I'm going, to, I'm going to have a, you know. Could I say the same thing is true of Christianity? Unless we build relationships, that which we preach about quickly becomes extinct. Because we're about the nature of God. The nature of God is love and not just theoretical love. Actual love that's difficult and faulty and sometimes hurtful. Actual love. Now in order to do this, now I get into the scripture. You knew I'd get here. It just, I just wander around a little bit. We go on a little walk and then we, then we get down to business. Here's business. In the Christmas story and in the planting of the church, remember how last week I told you the power of the spirit not only created the world in Genesis, but it created the Christ child in Mary, and it created the church, starting with the apostles and then Paul. So, what did they need in order to actually go on with their role? Let's start with Mary. Mary had this overwhelming sense that she was going to be a gift to the world. But she was a young girl. And she was very intimidated by this, as you can imagine. And so when the angel came to her, he didn't just say, hey, Mary, you're going to get pregnant. Because, you know, she, that she could, uh, you know, she said, how's that going to happen? Never been with a man. You go, well, Holy Spirit, remember? Holy Spirit, come, you know, come upon you, you know, the old money will overshadow you. All right. What else did he tell her, though? What was just as important for her? It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 36, 
The angel Gabriel said, and behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And so at this time, we go on to the other verses, at this time, um, um, Mary arose and went in a hurry and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And Elizabeth cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. How is it that it has happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? What just happened there? I'll tell you what just happened there. Here's a young girl that has to think, I'm going crazy. This can't possibly be happening to me. What does she need? She needs somebody in her life that will look at her and say, no, you're not crazy. Do you know what we all need? <laughs> somebody in our lives to look at us and say, you're not crazy. You're a gift to the world. To see in us what we can't admit is there. We all need that. You know why? Because we all have insecurities. Every one of us has insecurities. And we all need someone in our life to affirm us. I don't care how together you think somebody is, never underestimate people's insecurities. That's how mostly we react out of our insecurities. And Mary was not unusual. She had the same insecurities. She needed to go and have a confident, confidence with a woman who was going through some of the same stuff she was. This was an old lady who shouldn't have been able to get pregnant, and she was pregnant. So here's somebody who not only could say she's not crazy, but I kind of felt like I was crazy. And we're in this together. What God has put in you will never be fully realized until you have people in your life that not only look at you and say you're not crazy, but see a great gift in you. That is called an affirmer. And you not only need that, you need to be that for someone else. You know, I did a little graph this week. This is just how I think, and I'll, 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 this could get too complicated way too quickly. But I looked at the different categories of, of relationships that God gives us that we, need to, that we need to have in our lives for the full realization of what he's given us. And they kind of span from low risk to high risk and from affirming to non-affirming. And the first category I've just been talking about are close family and friends who, are, who favor you. When they look at you, they see only good. You know, we all need somebody. For me, this person was my grandmother. My grandma. Now, this is easier for grandmothers than it is for parents. You know, you get a little distance, you know. Every child is a challenge. Every grandchild is perfect. Just how it is. Every child is a challenge. Every grandchild is perfect. So my grandmother just thought I hung the moon. And when I, when I heard, for the, really for the first time, about this God who loved me, even though I was a sinner, who died for me, who saw a great gift in me, I could believe it. You know why? Because of my grandmother. Everybody needs somebody like this in their life. I married somebody like that. My wife looks at me and sees only good. What? Seriously. Now, don't get all Freudian weird with me about who married his grandmother. No, I didn't. It's a, my, my wife is hot, you know? It's, it's she's not my grandmother. It's a universal human need. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> it's a universal human need. And, and Becky will say, I mean, three or four times a day, you are awesome. And I'll just follow her around. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're awesome. What did you say? I didn't hear you. <laughs> we all need that in our lives. 
because there's a whole lot of people that are saying exactly the opposite. We need that. Mary needed that. And then we go on to the birth of the church and we see another role, that of validator. That of validator. Now Mary needed this too with Joseph, but I'll get to that in a minute. I want to talk to you about what happened with Saul. Saul, for all intents and purposes, after the, the original foundation of the apostles, was the mother of the church, uh, or the father of the church. Because he was the, he, 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 Saul became Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. And, 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 but what happened to him was, he had this horrible past where he was persecuting the church. Until Jesus came and knocked him <laughs> silly he went blind. He said, why do you keep doing this? Why are you persecuting me? And Saul came to his senses and saw who Jesus was. And his whole life changed. But Saul himself would have sat in that room blind unless someone else had come to him as a validator. The spirit goes to Ananias. This is in Luke and, and uh, I'm sorry, this is in Acts chapter 9. And he says, I want you to go to Saul and lay your hands on him and pray for him. And Ananias says, no. Are you, are you crazy? I know who this guy is. He's been, he's been, as a matter of fact, he says in, in 9.13, Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he's a chosen instrument of mine. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. All of us need people in our lives who will be our validators who are still a little suspicious of us. We do. I, I, um, I, I'm just naming off family members because it's the simplest thing uh, for me. My mother was like this. She raised me and she knew my propensity to mess up everything. There isn't a woman in this world who wanted to believe me more than my mother. But, but she always a little skeptical about me and, 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 and never, you know, to, to the public, buddy, I hung the moon, you know? She would, she just would extol me, but to my face, you know, there was always a little reminder. I can remember uh, being elected uh, president of my senior class, and I went home, and I told my mother, thinking, well, she'll be at least proud of this. And I went home and I said, Mom, I got elected to the president of the senior class. Now, my mother wasn't the religious type. I, I, I cushioned these, the following remarks. My mother looked at me, and she was grinning, and she said, oh, now I bet you think you're king crap, you know? <laughs> now, she didn't use the word crap, but I, I'm clear, this is church, all right? And it's bad enough saying crap in church. <laughs> and I could tell she was proud. But then she looked at me, she said, you ain't even regular crap, boy. You know, still grinning. Now, let me give you the translation, because you didn't know my mom. This was my translation. This is the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> she is so proud of you, but she doesn't want you to mess this up. Don't mess this up. I know your tendency to mess everything up. Don't mess it up. We need people like that in our lives. We need validators that aren't, haven't drunk the Kool-Aid. They know, or they, they look at us coldly and realistically and they want us to succeed with everything in them, but they will remind us that our feet are made of clay. And so there is this second category, the peers and associates. Ananias is one of those who are unsure. They're suspicious, but they see a gift. They're, they're validators, but they, but they have a little caution. All right, now let me go to the third category, and then, I'll, then I'll, I, I won't even, I won't get to the fourth one today, because I'll, I'll do it at a later time. The fourth category is secular angry people. 
people who are against your enemies, we'll deal with those later on. But the third category is traditionally religious. That is to say, Saul needed to be presented to a group of Christians. Let, uh, let me do this. Uh, put up the, 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 the other part of uh, Acts chapter 9. Saul wanted to get with Christians. And so it says, he came to Jerusalem. He was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, here's another validator. Here's another third-party validator. Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and, de de and, and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and, and how uh, at Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus and so on and so forth. So let me tell you something about religious people. When we say we want you to get involved in the church, many of you rightly say, ah, church people are a little prickly. And it's true. I, I, I think, you know, we're trying to do good. We're trying to have high standards. And, and, and we can tend to come off as, as judgmental and, and, and being very suspicious. Saul experienced this, you know, very suspicious. Until he needed somebody to kind of say, no, man, this guy's awesome. This guy's following the Lord. He needed that. All of us need that. You know, and, and let me go back to my, my squares. Joseph needed that. He, he, the, the, his validator, the validator for Mary, uh, turned out to be um, um, the angel Gabriel, who went to Joseph and said, no, she's all right. But what was Joseph's problem? He was traditionally religious. You know, your fiance shows up pregnant. Well, that's a little, that's, and you haven't done anything, and there's a, that's a little problem. Not, not, just, not just that she's pregnant, but what are you going to tell all your people, you know? So try not to embarrass her publicly. He's worried about the public. He's worried about the reputation of his religion, you know, his religiosity. And so he, just, he decided he was, going to, he was going to divorce her until the Holy Spirit showed up. The angel came. You know, I know, I know the need of this. In my life, when I came to Northland, some 30 years ago, my, I, my, most, most of my family is Catholic, and I have this, uh, one of my favorite uncles, Uncle Buzzy, he's a priest. And, you know, when I was a United Methodist pastor, he could, he could get over that. You know, that's a denomination. It's, it's all right. There's, okay. You know, I, there's Protestants. Okay. But when I came to a non-denominational church, that was nowhere on his screen. He never heard of one. He thought I had joined a cult. He did, because he was traditionally religious. I mean, he was old time Catholic, and it was bad enough to be Protestant, but you, what, what's a non-denominational church? I needed a validator. My Aunt Frances, who was charismatic Catholic, you know, went to her brother, Buzzy, and said, Buzzy, this is Joey. We can trust him. He's not a cult guy. He's reasonable. He's educated. He's cool. Come on, let's go down and see. So they came down. Like the third week, we were in that old rat infested road. It's getting rink over there. You know, there's my uncle, the priest, you know, looking around, fully satisfied that this was of the Lord. But I needed a validator, or he to this day, you know, he's still alive. He's like almost 90, so he's going around, you know. But to this day, he would have worried about me, you know, uh, being in a cult. All of us need those validators. And so, here's what we have. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit here because I, I started running off the mouth, and as, I, as is my tendency to do. But I, I want to get back to the point. In this next year, let's just set a, let's set a time. We want to make sure that every one of you has an affirming relationship with another Christian who will foster the gift that God has given them. Because all of us were made for us. Not to do this individually, but for us. And we want you to have an us. And we want you to have that 
in the church, either in the larger church or if you've got good friends, we want you to become a church. You don't have to, you have to come to a, a big service like this. Form a church. We'll help you. Because that's how the church is formed. It goes to where people are that want to build their lives around Christ and shows them how. But all of us need that kind of love and to love that way. All of us need to be affirmed and all of us need to affirm. All of us need to be validated by an independent source and all of us need to validate to people who may be suspicious what's going on inside of us or what's going on inside of someone else. Some of you remember when you were young and, and you played outside the house and you, you kind of got outside of your mother's voice, beyond your mother's voice and it, it would get dark and, and your eyes would adjust to the dark. That's what our eyes do. By the way, that's culturally what happens too. Slowly, we're adjusting to the darkness and we don't think it's so dark. We don't know how dark it is until we come into the light. But your mother would send somebody, and this is what they say. Your mom sent me, time to come in. And you'd argue, it's not even dark. Your mom sent me, time to come in. They came from someone who loved you. God did that same thing at Christmas. God came for us to pull us out of the dark together. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for these words. Thank you for these scriptures. Apply them to our minds that we might not grow shallow and to our hearts that we might not grow cold and to our feet that we might be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen.
Lord, you have come for us. Now help us to walk with you. Not just after we die, but every day we live. Your mission was to love us. Come and help us with our mission to love others. And give us the sweet assurance of love that stays no matter what. Some of us have prayed before to receive the gift of salvation. Some of us will pray now for the first time for it. But all of us need to know that heaven is not just in our future, it's among us now. And we can build relationships like they are in heaven with your power. Lord Jesus, you weren't just born in a manger, you died on a cross. And you paid for all of our sins so that we could live really live and love really love and really be loved every day thank you for the gift of salvation we receive it come into our hearts and live there and make of our lives whatever you want and go forth from our hearts to love other people in ways that only you can. And let us celebrate the way you changed this world because we loved. We pray this in your name, to your glory, to the extension of your kingdom.